can't think of a single other environmental issue that I've talked to audiences about that's as hard to describe as fracking because it takes place inside a subterranean world that's entirely invisible to us. It's a mile below our feet. That's where the Marcellus Shale lies. It's the basement of uh, upstate New York, but nobody's ever been down there, right? There's no Hubble telescope for the Marcellus Shale. So the challenge is to make people feel invested in the integrity of a landscape that, that nobody has ev ever seen. Um, so I start with this question because we're standing at this amazing crossroads, I think, in terms of energy. Um, we've already run through most of the easy-to-get fossil fuels. So the old days, there would be big bubbles of natural gas trapped underneath the shale, and all you had to do was sort of stick a straw down in it, and up it came. Um, but we've burned through all that, and so now uh, we can either decide to do something entirely different, like pursue a full bore affair with renewable energy sources, um, or we can um, continue down the path we're on, which will require ever more dangerous and toxic methods to exhume the fossil fuels from their fossil graveyards. And essentially, these new extreme methods of fossil fuel extraction take one of four forms. There's mountaintop removal, which goes on in Appalachia, in which we're blowing up uh, the tops of mountains to extract the last wisps of coal that are, those geological formations contain. Um, or we can uh, tear off the forests of uh, Alberta, Canada, and then scrape the soil and cook it to get the tar out of it. That's tar sands. Um, and in order to get the soil off, you have to completely decimate um, old growth boreal forests. Or we can go drilling for oil deep in the Gulf of Mexico with the results that we've, we've seen in the last year. Um, or the new kid on the block is hydrofracking for shale, in which we blow up the bedrock under our feet to get all the little tiny bubbles of, of methane out of there. So I think all of us have kind of visual images of the first three, right? Mountain top removal, we've seen pictures of that. We've seen, we can go online and see pictures of tar sands. Um, we all have very visual images of the BP oil spill. Um, but we don't really have any pictures of, of fracking um, other than the sort of very cinematic flaming faucets from J Josh Fox's uh, Oscar-nominated no film Gasland. So we, other than those flaming faucets, we can't really see the damage that, that we create. And I think the effect of that is that people don't pay enough attention to the damage of shale gas. And people think of it as the lesser of the evils. Because you can look up in you know, West Virginia or Kentucky, you can look at the, the, the horizon and see the missing mountains, and it just makes people feel bad. Um, but we can't look below our feet and see a blown up bedrock. Uh, and, and feel terrible about it, kind of in the same visceral way. So the first thing I want to do is try to take you down um, to the Marcel Shale in a kind of visual journey of what it's like down there, um, because I think we can begin to see how important it is for our life on the surface of the Earth um, to keep this bedrock intact if we have at least a, some kind of visual picture of, of what it is. So essentially, the Marcellus Shale is a chalkboard. It's about the size of Florida. That is about a mile below the ground uh, in northeastern uh, US. It, um, it goes from about Ohio over to the Catskills from west to east, and from upstate New York, where it's northern boundary here, down to West Virginia. Essentially, it's a graveyard. It was formed 450 million years ago when this whole area was covered by a shallow ocean. And that was long ago enough that there wasn't a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere yet, so that when the creatures who lived in that ocean died, the, the squids and the sea lilies and the plankton, their bodies didn't decompose the way they would now. Instead, they turned into bubbles of methane, which is what natural gas is. Uh, and so there are plenty of layers of shale on top of the Marcellus, but by then, those were deposited at a time when the atmosphere was much richer in oxygen, and so they don't contain all these bubbles of methane that the Marcellus does. So you have to go down a long way to get to the shale formations that are full of methane. Um, and so if you can imagine this kind of chalkboard um, that has contained within it a petrified fizz of bubbles, um, that is the Marcellus. 
Also inside these petrified sediments, um, that is the ancient seafloor, are all kinds of heavy metals and radioactive elements. And those came to be there because where the Catskill Mountains are now used to be another range of mountains that no longer exist because they've entirely eroded away. But geologists have given them a name anyway, even though there was nobody with a backbone around <laughs> to name them when they actually existed. They're called the Acadian Mountains. Um, and when these mountains eroded into the Marcellus, they deposited all of the elements that mountains contain, right, including arsenic, cadmium, lead, mercury, uh, chromium, all the so-called heavy metals. And, and some of these are radioactive, uranium, strontium, radon, and so forth. And so all those um, metals are bound up with the bubbles of methane and with the shale, which really is petrified silt, um, and they're all kind of locked together down there. And as long as they stay locked together, there's a mile between them and us, and they can't hurt anybody. Except that they do contribute right on to our basements, um, which is why we have to pay attention and make sure that when we build houses over top of the Marcellus Shale, we do a lot of ventilation and we check for radon and so on and so on. So with hydrofracking, um, what happens is that we drill down a mile into this shale formation, the Marcellus, and then turn sideways and drill another mile or so horizontally, which is why it's called horizontal high-volume high, uh, slick water hydrofracking. Um, and then we send down a steel pipe, which is encased by um, cement. That's called the casing. Um, and then we detonate explosives down in the horizontal part to kind of blow up, start to blow up the shale and also shatter the casing um, so that the gas bubbles can find little holes to get into the pipe. So the next step is to send a slurry of water with sand and chemicals under tremendous pressure down into um, those horizontal uh, shattered pipes. Um, and, and the pressure is about 10,000 uh, pounds per square inch, which is approximately the pressure that if you swung a baseball bat against the windshield of a car, that's what you would be exerting. Um, and what that, allow, what that allows to, to happen is you open, open up the uh, fractures that you've created with the explosives um, and insert propants, which are little um, um, grains of sand or little uh, pieces of ceramic that you send down in there with the slurry of stuff to hold open the cracks so that the bubbles can start to come, come out of the cracks. You have to use a lot of chemicals um, for a couple of reasons. One is you generate in a tremendous amount of friction simply sending water under that pressure down a very narrow opening. Um, so slick water refers to the chemicals you add to slick in the water to decrease the friction. You also need chemicals because in order to carry sand or ceramic beads around a corner and send them horizontally without them um, settling out, you have to thicken the water to, like, to make it gelatinous, to, to carry the sand along so it doesn't just settle out at the uh, curve in the pipe. Um, but then you have to add, later on in the process, things to thin out all that jello um, and dissolve it so that the gas can flow back up. So it's not just a cocktail of chemicals, it's actually a sequence of chemicals that you add one at a time. Also, there's living things down there under the ground. There's an actual ecosystem there, and geologists call this deep life. There are viruses, there are bacteria um, that actually feed on the hydrocarbons. And those are uh, organisms that are never found here on the surface of the Earth. They also slime up the pipes, um, creating what geologists call biofilm. Um, and so it interferes with the ability of the gas to come up. So you have to kill all the stuff that lives down there. So you need very powerful poisons called biocides or pesticides that you pour down the pipe to kill it all off. Now, you, there are ways of doing it that don't rely on those chemicals, but then you risk bringing all the organisms up with uh, the gas, and we don't know if they're pathogenic, or we don't just know, no creatures on the surface of the earth have ever been exposed to these guys that live down that far under the ground. So, um, you know, it, it's risky if you use the, the poisonous chemicals, it's risky if you don't use the poisonous chemicals. So what comes up then is not just the gas, um, but also all those chemicals that you added uh, to start with. Um, and there are huge volumes of them um, because you don't get a lot of gas. Um, all these ga the gas is spread out and it's very diffuse. So you have to put these chemicals uh, out a long way and then bring them all back up. So the high volume refers to the four to nine million gallons per well that you need. 
um, that's of water, and uh, you need about 10,000 gallons of chemicals. That's about the size of a backyard swimming pool. So four to nine million gallons of water requires a thousand different tanker truck trips to deliver for one wellhead, and then you need 10,000 gallons of chemicals on top of that. So about the si draining this, uh, a backyard swimming pool down every well is uh, just with the chemicals is what essentially what we're doing. So that all comes back up, except that about 30 to 70 percent of it um, stays under the ground. Um, so some of it is entombed in those geological strata, some of the water and the chemicals comes back up and then of course requires disposal somewhere. But it's not just the chemicals that we added that come up with the gas, it's also all those things that have been trapped down there in the Marcellus Shale for all these years, right? Including the radioactive isotopes, including the mercury, the arsenic, the lead, um, and all the other heavy metals, and including the very vaporous forms of petroleum. So methane is uh, one vaporous form of petroleum, but the others include things like benzene, toluene, um, xylenes. And so these chemicals are not natural gas, they're, but they're like, uh, they're vapors like natural gas. They also come up because they're, they've been trapped uh, in, as bubbles inside that shale for low these many years. And those are not benign. Benzene is a known human carcinogen. It's linked to, um, uh, well, you'll hear this later on in the panel on health effects. It's uh, a known to cause leukemia. It's um, a very strongly suspected of causing childhood brain tumors. Um, and it's linked to uh, aneuploidy uh, in sperm cells, meaning you can uh, you raise the risk for birth defects by messing around with the chromosomes of a man's sperm with exposure to uh, benzene. Toluene is a reproductive toxicant, meaning it interferes and sabotages human pregnancy. Um, and it's also related to, uh, it's a developmental neurotoxicant, which means it's related to brain damage. So like the heavy metals, uh, lead, mercury, uh, and arsenic, it has the ability to, in early life to paralyze migrating neurons in a uh, human fetus or an infant in ways that lead to cognitive deficits and learning disabilities uh, in, in later life. We all know the story about lead paint making kids stupid. Toluene has the same effect and it's one of the vapors that uh, come off of the gas wells. So. The EPA, which is our federal agency that tasked with protecting us from environmental hazards, is not overseeing any of this um, because of, of very cleverly the uh, gas companies early on in the process got themselves exempted from all the federal laws that oversee uh, um, other forms of uh, industrial processes that rely on toxic chemicals. So in other words, if you were doing anything else other than fracking and pouring poisons into the ground, the EPA would have to know about it and would have to oversee it and so forth. And you'd have to reveal the names of all the chemicals you were using. Um, but when Halliburton first pioneered this uh, technique um, in 2005, it introduced um, uh, into the law a special exemptions for hydrofracking, which means that they don't have to report under the Safe Drinking Water Act, under the Right to Know laws, under the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and so forth. So the EPA has been kind of illegally rendered helpless. It's not the sheriff that's overseeing any of this. So it's left to all the different individual states um, to uh, figure out what they want to do. And as you might know, New York is alone among 32 states in saying no right now. We, we are in a period of uh, of pushing the pause button. We've declared a sort of de facto temporary moratorium while we await um, the release of a document called the um, SGEIS, which is the Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement, uh, which a lot of us feel is an inadequate look at the risks that hydrofracking poses to us because it d did not take into account cumulative impacts. So it only looks at one gas well at a time um, 77,000 gas wells are envisioned for upstate New York and of course the accumulation of all the air pollution and all the water pollution is what biologically we'll experience, not just uh, one uh, well. Mm -hmm.